There we go. One of these days he's going to learn to play that thing. What do you think? Yeah, so it made sense then. Okay. Hey, welcome to you. Awesome. Glad you're here this morning. If you're a guest hey, with man. us, we just invite you to join in as a family gets together to celebrate who God is and who we are in him. And uh, we're going to spend some time opening his word. Pastor John's going to come in a, in a moment and talk with us about uh, uh, just a wow. challenge in our lives. What's next? How do we move forward in our lives? A day by day and walking with God. Glad that you're a part of it. If you're with us on our iCampus this morning, we just say welcome to you as well. And, uh, you know, we've got coffee and bagels and donuts and all kinds of good things here in the room. Uh, I'm, I don't know if on the iCampus where you are, if you're somewhere, I hope you've got something you can snack on and drink on, but we're glad that you've joined us. Pastor Dave's online with you on the iCampus this morning, and we just welcome you into this experience as well. Glad you're here. It's kind of a Kind of a special day in a lot of ways, and you're going to discover that as we move through this service. We had a powerful time uh, and a full house in the first hour, and, and we're glad that you're here for this hour. Uh, God has been doing some cool things, and we want to make you uh, aware of what some of those things are. Where's, uh, where's Kyra? Kyra, come up here. I don't, want to, uh, I don't want to forget you. I want you to take a good look at this young lady. Is this not a beautiful young lady? Hmm? One of the things that's happening this morning, I said there's a lot going on this morning, but one of the things that's happening is our children are serving all over the place. The coffee you're drinking was probably helped serve by one of our children. We've got children in the back at the tech areas. We've got uh, out here in the, I think they're over, I know they're in the hospitality area and they're in the greeting ministry all over the place. They're serving and you're going to see that. And Kyra has some couple of things that she wants you to know about. So give a listen. Memorial weekend is May 24th. We all have one service at 10 a.m. Is that it? How about that, huh? Hey! Outstanding, outstanding. Now, I want you all to know, don't get the big head or anything, okay? But the first service didn't get that, all right? First service didn't get in on that. So uh, once you're a little special this morning. Lots of other things going on as well. One of the cool things that in the early church, when you read through Scripture, so you get past the Gospels and you start seeing how the, the message of Jesus that he has risen and that God loves folks and has a plan for their lives and that's what Jesus coming to earth was all about and churches began to form and one of the cool parts in the early church when you watch Acts and then all of those little epistles is how the church got to send the folks out from where they were to help other communities. Sometimes it was sending money. Sometimes it was sending people. I mean, they were commissioning Paul and Silas and missionaries to go out and to take God's word into other areas. And they considered it a privilege. I mean, it was an honor for God to reach in and to kind of take a bit of them and say, I need to transplant a bit of who you are and plant that over here for the advancement of my kingdom. God's been doing that here at Northbridge as well. He's done it all throughout our history, but he's doing it again, and we want you to know about it and celebrate. I want to get uh, Keith and Sharon Vanderveen, and Kyvin, you join me, and uh, Abigail's probably not in here yet, is she? So we'll, uh, Abigail's uh, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, children's area. 
Uh, but uh, no, most of you know uh, Abigail. When, the, when God began to stir about planting a church on the north side of Greene County, uh, like he does, he takes a small little something. You know, when he created us, the Bible says he kind of reached down into the dust of the earth, and then he created, boom, here we are. Uh, when he plants a church, he takes a small little remnant uh, and, and watches that as it grows. And when God began to stir that about this church, part of that little uh, small remnant, that small group that he plucked was Keith and Sharon Vanderveen and Kyvan and Abigail wasn't in the picture at that time, I, I don't think, and said, I want you guys, I need you guys to be a part of that planting core. And so Keith and Sharon and Kyvan were a part of our planting core that gave birth to what God has done through the years here at Northbridge. And then not very far into the plant of Northbridge, this idea for an iCampus kind of came on our radar, and we began to develop that and get some cameras, and we got a great crew that works that so that folks around the world can worship with us and participate with us. And uh, God has been stirring in Keith and Sharon's heart uh, expanding their influence in ministry all through their adult lives. I mean, I've just had the privilege of see that even before the Northbridge days and had tapped on their shoulder, I'm going to do, I'm going to do a little bit more. I need you to do a little bit more. I'm going to, I need your influence to spread just a little bit wider. And God tapped on Keith's shoulder and on the shoulder of our church and said, I want you to give leadership to our iCampus ministry. And so since its inception, the iCampus pastor has been Keith Vanderveen. And walking alongside him, Sharon has served in so many ways in our children's ministry, in our women's ministries, uh, in our small group ministries. They have been a core leadership family to us. Can't overstate. Sometimes when God kind of takes something away, we have a natural tendency to feel sad about that. But I just have to be honest with you. I just never felt that. Here's what I've, there's a little piece of sadness and sorrow because I'm not going to see them, although I love living in the 21st century with Facebook and Twitter and, and all those kinds of things. So I'm going to still talk to them, okay? But uh, I've, I've always been honored when God has reached into our congregation and said, I need, I need to pull a little bit of you out and transplant it over here. And so today, church, we are honored that God is transplanting Keith and Sharon and Kyvan and Abigail. They're going to send them off to his country in Colorado and Colorado Springs, and Keith is going to be on staff at Focus on the Family Ministries, a powerful legacy ministry that helps equip families globally to understand God's heart and God's ways for raising the family. We are so excited for them. We're excited that God felt Focus on the family needs a little bit of Northbridge in it. And uh, I can't wait to see what God's going to do in their life. So we wanted you to be aware of that. And uh, uh, in, in honor of and recognition of all that Keith has done as our iCampus pastor through the years, Pastor Tony had a little plaque here made up. It's, you know, it kind of looks like a little bit like Colorado, doesn't it? I mean, you can kind of get the Grand Tetons happening there in this little plaque. Here's what this says, church. This is from you. In appreciation of your ministry as iCampus pastor, Keith Vanderveen, Northbridge Church, May 3rd, 2015. Keith, I'm going to give you that. Here's a little card. We've scribbled in that as well. We love you guys so much. I'm going to ask you guys to slide right down here, if you would. And... You know, I said there's a lot going on this morning. God's just been actively, actively at work while they're standing here. And you're thinking about, wow, how cool is that? Let me tell you another cool piece. Uh, Brandon and Michelle, will you join me? I'm just going to come down here and join you, and hopefully the lights will, and the cameras can, can, can get us. Uh, you know Brandon and Michelle. They're, they've been a part of us for, I don't know, a year and a half, year, somewhere in there. I don't know. Maybe. Uh, well, Okay, all right. Well, we feel like we've known them forever, so what, what, whatever that means. But uh, <laughs> crew, uh,
somebody else, if you will, and uh, we're going to continue our service. Okay, church, go ahead and be seated. And I tell you what, Pastor Mike was absolutely right. We have a lot of working parts, a lot of moving parts today. And I, I tell you something that might be cool for you, a little challenge. Uh, when I was going through the first service and you had all these different things happening, I, I saw there was a commonality. There was, there was like a common theme uh, that we didn't plan but just happened. It just, you know, God, the agency of the Holy Spirit just put these parts together and so maybe be looking for what is that theme today? What is your theme? And if you come up with one, uh, you know, maybe if you have Facebook access or Twitter access, just put that out there. Tweet that. Put it on the Northbridge Facebook page of what your theme was today as you saw all these different things kind of coming together and developing. Uh, another piece, another part of the puzzle that I wanted to talk to you guys about, uh, I have a friend here. His name's Corey West. Uh, Corey and I, actually, we knew each other back in the day in college. Uh, mm -hmm. I was just graduating school, and Corey was like, what, 15 at the time, right? Yeah, right? Does yeah. that make you better? Yeah, we'll call it that. Yeah. Uh, Corey was just starting school when I was kind of finishing. Actually, and, you know, Corey, I remembered, uh, too, that there was a season of time, like there was like like four, eh, two months, two months, yeah, something two months, like that, yeah. that I was actually rooming with Corey, and he just couldn't handle it anymore and just basically booted me out. Kicked him know? out. Hey, he's, I'm done with you, Tony. I forced me to grow up. So uh, Corey and I have had deep roots, and he's done something a little different. Uh, kind of stepped out there in faith a little bit. And so uh, I want you to welcome Corey. And, and uh, Corey, tell us what uh, what is it that you've stepped out and what are you doing now? What's going on in your life? Yeah, well, my wife and I, my wife's name is Carrie. And for the last uh, 15 years, we've been married. For the last 18 years, I've served in student ministry. Uh, all over in the last five years specifically been at Second Baptist Church here in Springfield and uh, love that, love students. But about a year ago, the Lord just began to speak to our heart about uh, something different and that being church planting. And so we were uh, excited, uh, scared to death, uh, but and now we've, we've started that adventure. We moved everything down uh, January of this year, moved everything to Houston, Texas, uh, where we served previously for about three years. And when we when we were there, we went to Texas kicking and screaming because everybody, everything really is bigger in Texas, huh. including their egos. And so we were like, oh, man, we don't want to go to Texas. That's like our Africa, Lord, anywhere but Texas. But, um, but sure as a world, we went to Texas and just saw a receptivity of the gospel there that we've just never experienced. And uh, the Lord has just really placed that place in our heart and uh, placed them in our heart. And we had the opportunity to do this, and the Lord just called us toward that. Really exciting. So we've moved down there. We're planting a church and have just started the process of all of that over the last few months. Okay, so now you, you know, I heard you saying that, okay, you're down in Texas, you're in Houston because God called you there. So I, yeah. I can't ask you, well, why, well, why Texas? You know, I yeah. can't do that because God called you there. But I think a fair question is, really, another, another church in Houston, yeah. Texas? I mean, what is that, their millionth church now that you're starting? So, yeah. so in regards to that, is there a need? What is the need in Houston, Texas? Yeah, that's, that's, and that's a fair point. Um, yes, there are a lot of churches in Texas. There's, there are thousands of churches in Houston alone, but they're not doing an effective job. And I think the vast majority of them are not doing an effective job at reaching people that are far from Jesus, and they're not doing an effective job of making disciples and sending disciples out on mission to live for the kingdom. And so uh, what we have experienced is, is, yes, that's true, but while 75% or greater would, say, would identify themselves as Christians in Houston, in greater Houston, we're in a burb of that, uh, the reality is, is that around 40% or maybe even less 
uh, attend any type of evangelical gathering, any type of evangelical church, just once a month. And those numbers are growing, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's getting, well, or it's, spreading. Yeah, it's getting, it's getting more less and yeah. less and less that those folks are actually committed to following Jesus. And so, and that's just of church attenders. Um, that's not folks that are living out the mission that Jesus has given them. Yeah. Yeah, there's real interesting work and in, in a thought process, and they call it the, the de-churching of America. And that's mm -hmm. really in the major urban areas, isn't it, right. where that we're seeing as generation, as we keep, continue to go forward in the years, people's church mem churchmanship and their commitment to Christ is declining. Yeah. Uh, and so you're sitting there going, hey, we got to do something about this. Right, yeah. And so for us, you know, Houston is the uh, fourth largest city in the United States, Within the, next, uh, within the next 20 years, they expect it's going to be the third largest. Um, it's a huge metropolitan area, Houston specifically is. Uh, there, right now in the metropolitan area, there's more than 6 million people living there. By the year 2030, they're expecting that number to be over 9 million, and by the year 2040, they're expecting over 11 million. And so that, that specific area is growing exponentially. And Houston is also the most international city in the United States. A lot of folks don't realize that. There, it's not that there are more internationals living there, because frankly, New York has more than that. But there are different people groups, more languages spoken, uh, to where the nations truly are coming to Houston, uh, much for education purposes, for employment opportunities, and then spreading right back out and going back to their home countries in a lot of circumstances. So literally, the nations are coming to us. And we have the opportunity, and we need to leverage that opportunity to present the gospel, to share the gospel, to live the gospel, and to challenge people to live on mission in that way. Very good, very good. One of the, one of the uh, things that we're doing, church, and the reason why we're bringing Corey here, I mean, you know, reality is there's hundreds of church planters across Springfield uh, at any given time, and we don't bring hundreds of church planters up here to just talk about their work. Sure. The reason why we're bringing Corey up here and inviting him is because uh, about two months ago, uh, the leadership at Northbridge said, you know what, this is a work that we resonate with. Uh, partly why we resonate with, with what's going on, the church's name is Connexus Church. Uh, the reason why we resonate is they're very similar to us. Very simple model, uh, trying to make disciples who make disciples. Uh, you know, just saying, let's just do a few things and do them as good as we can. Right. And focusing on, on just the connection through small groups and small, mm -hmm. small gatherings of people. Gathering together to worship together on Sundays, serving the community. You know, that's yeah. exactly who we are. And uh, so we said a couple of, of months ago that this is a work that we need to speak into. And we need to bless and we need to partner yeah. with. And so a couple of months ago, we voted to, to as a, the leadership, voted to, to step next to them for the next couple of years and uh, partner with Corey and Connexus Church. Now, what that partnership looks like is we give... Uh, you. You know, most of you are aware that, that you give towards a missions emphasis, a missions uh, offering that we take up regularly uh, that's called Go Going Global. And part of that money, some of that money goes towards Corey. Okay, now, you know, I want to make it clear that we're not, uh, if the Lord compels you to give above and beyond what we do, you know, what Corey basically does is buy like one chair a month with what we're <laughs> giving him. You know, I mean, you know, we're not given thousands and thousands of dollars every month or anything like that. We're, we're, we give $50 a month as a way just to, hey, can we help pay part of the electric bill even? You know, can we just do something here? Yeah. A bigger thing of what we do beyond the money is saying prayer support. Yeah. Uh, knowing that we as a church will be connecting regularly, praying for Corey, praying for Connexus Church, praying for the people that he encounters in, uh, in Houston, Texas. And, uh, and we're just going to partner to do that and say, hey, okay, these folks, God is holding us responsible to lift them up and pray for them. And, and a, a third area, I would say, is the idea of going. Uh, no doubt in the next couple of years, we're going to have opportunity to take some small groups, take some uh, mission trips for a week time to do special projects in Houston and to help serve their church, help serve the community around Connexus. And so, you know, be keeping your eyes open. We'll, we'll be doing that in the next couple of years and having some opportunities for that. And I'd say this, Corey and I were joking around about it, but but I'm dead serious, Corey. Corey uh, down it was saying, hey, uh, you know, if you want to help uh, relieve some 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 seating capacity, you know, if there's a family or two that wants to go to Texas and and serve with us, you know, they they're more than welcome to come. And you know, he's joking. Well, I'm dead serious, you know. And I, if there's someone here that is feeling a tug of the Holy Spirit of saying, you know what, I'm sensing maybe I'm supposed to. Uh, you know, that's a big move. I know that. I know that's a huge move. But, you know, maybe there's someone that God's saying to them, hey, you need to, 
to sell your home, you need to find a new job, and you need to move to Houston, Texas. And, you know, if that's you, uh, connect with me. I'll connect you to Corey. Yeah. And, you know, know that that invite is there uh, as well, that if someone would be so compelled to move, we would support that. We would champion that. We'd be so excited about that. Corey, right now, as we kind of conclude this moment, yeah. tell me about a win. Tell me about something that's happened in, in someone's life that you've already experienced just in the past few months as you've been yeah. down there serving. Lots of wins already in just a short amount of time. We have five families that are committed to doing this with us. Uh, on Good Friday, we baptized four people in our pool. Um, we, have, we are renting a house, and it just so happened that it had this great outdoor space, had a pool. Had a pool in it. And, um, and so when we saw that, that was kind of the clincher for us is because we knew that we were going to have a lot of people over. And so on Good Friday, we got to baptize four folks. Uh, which was really awesome and really, really cool. Our core team has met together two times. Beginning in June, we're going to start meeting every single week. We've already connected with neighbors that are far from Jesus um, and that hold the keys to the entire community. Uh, so we're trying to be very um, just on the ground and just connecting with people. The name Connects Us is all about connecting people with God and each other. That's where it came from. For us, we just want to be faithful in, in fulfilling the Great Commission and the great commandment. We want to love God. We want to love people. We want to make disciples who make disciples so that we hear well done. And um, we want to invite people into that as well. So like Tony said, if that's if the Lord is, is maybe speaking to your heart about a way of partnership and what that could look like, man, I would love to chat with you about that. And seriously, um, I think it would be such a cool thing if there were a family or two that the Lord just said, this is something I have for you. You're going to work a job, you're going to do that, but you're going to be fulfilling the kingdom. Because friends, hear me, you are on mission, and you are church planters. You're called to do that right here, whether it's here or Texas or somewhere else in between. You're called to do that. And so just really blessed by the opportunity to be here. Thanks for being so welcoming, for, uh, for supporting us and partnering with us, for praying for us. We, we desperately need it. Uh, there's a whole lot of folks right in our cul-de-sac that don't know Jesus and that we're trying to develop relationships with so that we can leverage them for the gospel. So be praying for us in that. Well said. Thank you, Corey. I want you to uh, step down to the stage, uh, yes, off sir. the stage on the floor here. And Corey's coming down here. And I'm just going to ask the church, hey, if you guys would partner and say, you know what, Tony, I, I can't speak about moving to Houston right now. I need to pray on that a little bit. But you know what I can speak on is I will be faithful to commit to praying for Corey and, and his wife, Carrie. And I will be faithful to pray for Conexus Church and the people of Houston, Texas. If, uh, you know, if that's you, would you just come on up, step up out of your chair and, and surround Corey right now. Put a, Just like we did with Keith, put a hand on Corey's shoulder. Uh, if you're saying, hey, you count on me praying for you. You know, one of the things, Corey will be sending me emails and, and we'll get some, some more names to him so he can send other people directly emails about prayer requests. But but as I get those emails and I'll shoot them out to our prayer, prayer team and, and to the church and let's just be faithful in praying for Corey. And matter of fact, just to keep on going with our student tradition today, uh, you know, ask Rebecca Loya to come and pray. Rebecca, is there a question? Do you have a question for Corey? No? Okay. Well, then why don't you just pray for Corey right now, okay? Dear God, I pray that you will give Corey and Carrie safe travels to Texas, and that they will continue to have enough support and money to continue the church. Please give them the courage to make relationships there. Pray lots of people will go to the church Come in faith, come to faith in Jesus, and learn more about you. Please keep Corey and his family safe through the process of continuing the church and give them wisdom. Amen. Romans eight thirty one through thirty nine. So what do you think? With God on our side like this, how can we lose? If God didn't hesitate to put everything on the line for us, embracing our condition and exposing himself to the worst by sending his own son, is there anything else he wouldn't freely, gladly and freely do for us? And who would dare tangle with God by messing with one of God's chosen? Who would dare even point a finger? The one who died for us, who was raised to life for us, is in the presence of God at this very moment, sticking up for us. Do you think anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? There's no way. Not trouble, not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying threats, not backstabbing, 
not even the worst sins listed in scripture. They kill us in cold blood because they hate you. We're sitting ducks. They pick us off one by one. None of this phases us because Jesus loves us. I'm absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing living or dead, angelic or demonic, today or tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way that Jesus, our master, has embraced us. I invite you to stand and uh, join us in a song.
song with you guys and invite you to take a seat and then uh, join us as you learn.
Let me add my welcome to you, man. We have had just a, a, oh, sorry, Doug, stepped on your cord. A, you're trying to trip me, aren't you? That would have been an interesting way to start the service, wouldn't it? Um, man, we have had just such a, a cool experience, a cool service uh, so far. And, and uh, the really cool thing is that, like the first service, I had to keep it really tight because uh, we were honoring the Vanderveens at the end of service. Well, we've already done that, so uh, I can go as long as I want to now. So I don't have to worry about keeping it tight. I don't have to cut anything out. Uh, and just for uh, you prom teenagers, I know there's some out here that uh, have had a late night of, of prom. Um, I will call you out if I see you asleep, so uh, just, just know that. And uh, I can say one name and call out two people at the same time. So, Man, we're excited you're here. We're glad you're here. Um, what a cool thing. I, you know, every Sunday I'm here, I just I feel like I, I can see why. Some people can be just Sunday to Sunday Christians because you experience, we experience so much goodness and so much of God in, in one place. And it is so cool to see these kids lead out. It is so cool that we have a team of, of people that work with them and, and teach them and lead them. Uh, praise God for that team. It is so cool that we have an opportunity to, to, to partner and to help plant churches. That is who we are, people. That is what we have been and are and have become. And it is so cool. It is not anything that is insignificant that we have an opportunity to help a church plant in Houston, Texas. We have an opportunity just by partnering with them for people to come to know Jesus Christ as a result of you and as a result of your support, your prayer support, and your, and your giving. That is so cool that we have uh, that opportunity. And so just, again, I just thank God for that, just experiencing that uh, today. So today um, we're continuing a series that, that Tony uh, led off with last week called What's Next? And it's just uh, that last week and this week. And so the idea of, of this, uh, this particular two weeks is what's next for us as Christ followers? What's next for us after we take that, that step of faith? And, you know, Tony start, tar- started talking last week about what it looks like to live 
in and under God's authority in our lives, working in us and through us as we invest in other people. And he talked about just a very critical part of who we are as a church, our mission, and that is, that is to get to lead spiritual seekers to becoming uh, growing followers of Jesus Christ. That is so important to who we are uh, as a church. And he talked about uh, what we call our five G's. Uh, and does anyone remember what our five G's are? I'm not going to put you on the spot. But, oh, I heard him coming from back there. That was good. Growth is one of them. There's, there's, there's grace, and there's growth, and there's groups, and there's gifts, and there's giving. Those are the five things that we can kind of look at as Christ followers and kind of maybe measure who we are and where we are in our walk with Jesus Christ. And so today, what the idea was, was to, to lay out maybe some practical things or some practical ways that we as Christ followers can continue on in our spiritual walk, in our walk with Jesus Christ. And as much as I tried to make that happen, it just never went that way. So I apologize if that was what Tony set up, what today was supposed to be about. But here's the deal. It just kind of, as I prayed and as I looked, it just kind of veered from there. And so today, really what I want to talk to us about more than anything um, in, in the next few minutes is what keeps us, what keeps us from living that as that person that Christ created us to be? What keeps us from living and living out that walk the way Jesus Christ uh, wants us to live or has us living? In, in, in the Bible, uh, once, once we have crossed that, that faith line, once we have given our life to Christ, once we have given authority of our lives over to him and have accepted his free gift of salvation, the Bible says that we are a new person, that we're a new person. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, the new has begun. Now, the key word here is belongs to, okay? Not just believe in, but belongs to, okay? We're not just a, a better person because we try harder, okay? We are made new in Christ Jesus as a Christ follower. Okay? We're not just turning over a new leaf on life. We are experiencing a new life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so the question is today, what if I don't feel new anymore? What, what, you're, you're talking about this new creation. I'm this new creation in Christ, and I understand that, but what if I don't feel new anymore? I remember um, right after high school, actually about a year after high school, I had an opportunity to move out. Uh, with a friend of mine. And I was really excited about moving out. I mean, it was just like I was a, a new person uh, starting a different part of my life, okay? I was like going to be very mature, and I didn't have anyone that had any authority over me. I could do what I wanted to do. I didn't have anyone to tell me when to pick up my wet towel. I didn't have anyone to tell me to make my bed, not, no one to make me study or whatever I wanted to do. I could do anything I wanted to, and I had all these, these great expectations of what this new life was going to be like, okay? And, and my roommate and I, we were pretty smart about it. I mean, we, we, when we originally moved out, we set up rules and we set up things that we would live by, you know, like, like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, he would do the dishes and like Thursday or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, I would, no one would do them on Sunday because obviously that's a day of rest, right? And so, you know, one week he would clean the bathroom, the next week I would clean the bathroom. Uh, if we went grocery shopping, you know, there's things that obviously we would get on our own, but there were things that we both used quite a bit of. And so maybe he would get like the bread and milk on one with his trip, and I'd get like the peanut butter and jelly because that was a high diet of those things when we were living together. And so we had it all worked out. And, and for the longest, you know, for, for a while, I mean, our, our apartment was nice. It was neat. It was kept. You know, the, the dishes were done. The bathrooms were cleaned. You know, all good things come to an end, though, don't they? You know, in a couple of years when we decided to, to part ways and move out, I don't know what had happened between the time we moved in in those first couple of months to the time that I moved out. But I can remember my, my, my wife, we weren't married at the time, but Tammy came over, she was helping me move out, and my parents and some of our friends. And I remember her going to the bathroom and she screamed. And I, and I went in the bathroom and I said, what's the matter, what's the matter? She's like, look at this tub. She said, I mean, what is that black ring and what, what is on the bottom of this bathtub? When is the last time you washed the tub or cleaned the tub? Well, what do you mean? I wash it every day. I mean, when you use shampoo and soap on your body, as it rinses off, that soap, that washes the tub, right? Well, I guess not. You know, and, and, and when we were moving out of my room and the dresser and, and we got to my bed, and I can remember, I think it was my mom, she looked at my sheets 
And she said, when is the last time you washed your sheets? Now, I had some really cool, like, Empire Strikes Back sheets. I mean, they were really cool. I mean, it had, like, the Millennium Falcon. It had, like, Luke on his Tauntaun. If you're an Empire Strikes Back guy, you know uh, what a Tauntaun is. And they were really cool. They were blue and gray and, and really crisp. But by the time I moved out, they were kind of yellow and not much so gray and blue anymore. So what happened in that time between then and there? And see, I think... I think our, Christ, our, our Christian walk, our, our, our walk with Christ sometimes is a little bit like that. You know, I, th- I think when we first give our life to Christ, man, we, we just have all kinds of these grand expectations because we're new, because we're different, and we experience something amazing. And, and we join a, a great church, and, and things are going great, and we have a lot of expectations about what it is that God wants to do in us and through us, and we understand that, and, and things are going great. And then what happens is maybe like over time, and maybe we don't realize it, but over time, you know, we just find ourselves just kind of going through the motions of Christianity. And, and sometimes Christianity becomes more of a religion than a relationship. And we just kind of check off our Sunday mornings. And we just kind of check off this. And this is a part of what I did today that deals with, you know, this Christ thing and this Christian thing. And we just kind of that walk this mundane, mundane life of Christianity. So what happens? What happens? How do we get to that point? What happens? Why don't we feel new anymore? Well, here's what I think. I think what happens is we begin to lose focus. We lose focus on, on what matters most to us as a Christ follower. We begin to allow things to kind of infiltrate our life, or we allow things to come into our life that take our focus off of the reality of what Christ Jesus did for us to begin with. We allow things to pull us away from our understanding of what Christ did for us on the cross. And I think we also allow things to infiltrate our life and come into us to pull us focus off of what our true purpose is here as a Christ follower, and that is to share his love, his grace, his mercy, and his forgiveness to other people, to invest into other people so that they can experience, too, the love of Jesus Christ. And I think what happens is we allow things to pull us off of our focus of where it should be, and we begin to just kind of drift, and we begin just to kind of have this going through the motions type of, of, of walk with God. So what are some of those things, then, that kind of pull us off of our focus or pull us away from being focused on where we should. So here's a couple of them. The first one I think is priorities. What are your priorities? If I were to ask you to write down on a piece of paper what is the most important thing in your life right now, what would it be? Does it line up with who you are in Christ Jesus? Does it line up with what your purpose is as you are created in Christ Jesus to share his love and his grace and his mercy with other people? Does it line up with that? What is your priority? And there's a lot of things in life that are important. And there are a lot of priorities that are good things. I'm not saying that we, you know, that we, all these things are bad things. Let's look at family for a second. I mean, family is important. I mean, family is is probably one of the top priorities for all of us, right? I mean, we want to make sure we have a happy family. We want to make sure that we experience things as a family. We want to make sure our kids experience things and are involved in things and have opportunities for things. And there's nothing wrong with that. But when those things pull us away from the priority of who Christ is in our lives, then it's going to pull us off focus. I, I love uh, our small group just got done reading a book by Francis Chan called You and Me Forever. And it's, it's a really interesting book uh, regarding marriage. It's kind of a different perspective. And, you know, Francis Chan's writings are a little interesting, and he's a little bit of an extremist. But in some ways, I kind of like that because it causes me to think about some things. And, and one, thing, one, one of the parts of his reading he talked about is he said this. He said, you know, inevitably, all of us are going to meet our maker face to face. At some point, it's inevitable. We will come face to face with the living God. And as awesome as that's going to be, I mean, think about that for just a moment. You will come face to face with your creator. And how cool that will be, how awesome that will be, and an experience that we, will, we can't even put in words what that will be like. And at the same time, how scary and terrifying that may be because of the, the, the holiness and the glory that is in God. And he says, you know, as, as, as amazing as that moment in time will be, your spouse one day will experience that moment. 
And your children will experience that moment. And I can even take it even further. Your parents will experience that moment. And let me tell you, and your grandparents and your aunts and uncles and people, and your friends, they will experience that moment when they are face to face with the living God. And then he said this, he said, have you done everything you possibly can to make sure they are prepared for that moment? Have you done what you have needed to do, everything that you could possibly do to make sure that your spouse is prepared and ready to meet that, their, their, their maker? And so that puts things back in perspective. See, that puts things back into the reality of, you know what, Jesus Christ and what he did for me is an amazing thing, and I can't lose focus of that. And it puts it back in perspective that we have a purpose here in this world, in this life, and that is to show and share the love of Jesus Christ in our families and, and, and elsewhere. There's other priorities that kind of get out of line. Our work can be a priority. Our career can can be a priority. I mean, everything we do can be focused on what it is that we want to accomplish and, and, and how we want to accomplish that. And we can forget about the, the idea that God placed us in a, in a dark world to be light, in a place where sometimes you may be the only light that people have an opportunity to experience. I mean, some of you work in some, some areas where people really need to see the, the goodness of God. And he has placed you there to share that love and that, and, that, and that joy and that mercy that comes from God. That has to be in, put in its proper perspective. Some of us, our hobbies, our hobbies can be our priority. I know a, a gentleman, I, I'm friends with a gentleman that meant everything he does, he's like an addictive personality. Everything he does, he has to go 110,000% at it. If he's going to be, you know, he got into golf and he had to get golf clubs and he had to practice this and do this and then he wanted to try out for the Missouri Amateurs competition and then he got bored with that and he decided to be a biker and so he decided to get a, like a bicycle biker, not like a, like a Harley, like a bike. And so he, he went and he bought like the most expensive bike he could buy and, and like every day I would try to get in touch with him. I was like, hey, what are you doing? He's like, oh, been riding like 50 miles and then tomorrow I'm going to go 110 miles and, and then I'm going to do like the Tour de France and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, and then he wanted to get into body, you know, to working out and he couldn't just work out. He had to get into bodybuilding. I mean, it was just an extremist and our hobbies can take priority in our lives. And when our hobbies, when our, when our family, when our careers and whatever it might be that is most important to you, when those begin to take focus and take precedence in our life, it pulls us off of our focus of who God is and who he created us to be. And our priorities can hurt us. So if you were to sit down today at the table with your family and say, hey, let's write down on a piece of paper, what do you think the most important thing to us is? What would they write? If you were to go to a friend of yours who knows you really well, and you say, hey, write on a card what you think the most important thing in my life is, I want to know, what would they say? Does it line up with where our priorities should be? The other thing that I think is, is really big, um, and this is probably one of the biggest things, that keep us and pull us away from God is this, and that's habitual sin. And I'm not talking about just, you know, sinning. I'm not, I mean, all of, us, all of us make mistakes. All of us sin, okay? But I'm talking about habitual sin. I'm talking about direct disobedience to God. Activities in your life that you know God has convicted you of, God has shown you of, and you continue to do them in direct disobedience to him. It's interesting. I, I think it's, it's, it's so interesting because we fail, to, we fail to remember this, that to be new in Christ is to be freed from sin and our habits. To be new in Christ, to be a Christ follower, to, to accept him and to give him authority in our life means that we have been created and we are a new creation. And it means this, that we are freed from our sin and our habits. But here's where a lot of people kind of get tripped up. Here's where a lot of us kind of, kind of get messed up. See, we have this intellectual understanding and this intellectual awareness and knowledge of the things of God. And, and, and we can see that evident in churches all over America where, where the scripture is preached and where, where things are taught. And, and people sit in, in their seats, just like here in other churches. They sit in their seat and they nod their heads. Yes, we understand that God forgives. Yes, we understand that he can heal us from our habits. Yes, we understand that. And in those same churches, in those same places, people walk through the door. God-fearing, God-loving, good people walk out that door and they go home and they continue to drink. 
or they continue to have a habitual problem with alcoholism. They continue to look at the internet and pornography. They continue to con want to take drugs that maybe they started taking when they had an injury, but they just continue to take them because they feel like they have to have them. They continue to get on the internet and want to buy things over and over and over because they feel they need that. They continue to live a lifestyle in contradiction to what God's command is in their lives. So how is it, how is it that, that we can have churches all over America and people have an understanding, they intellectually understand that God forgives, and they understand that they are made new, but yet they just can't stop doing whatever. You fill in the blank. Read with me uh, Ephesians 4.21. Through 24. It says, Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. So Paul says, Listen, he said, since you have heard about, since you have come in relationship with God, in other words, since you have come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, you've learned the truth. You've learned the truth about what is right, what comes from him. And he says, listen, throw off, get rid of, destroy it. Get as, with as much vigor as you can, throw it off, get rid of it, and put on what? Your new self. Because the old way, it's full of lust and it's full of deception. Instead, let the Spirit, let the Spirit of God renew your thoughts and your attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. See, here's the deal. Several years ago, many years ago, and in fact, it was when Tammy and I were, were dating and probably first married, you know, I really realized I had an issue with anger. I was an angry person. Not that I just occasionally got mad. You know, everybody gets mad, okay? But I was angry. I was an, I was an angry person. Person. And I'll be honest with you, it probably was a, a learned behavior because I guarantee you, I think my dad's father was an angry person and I think his, pro his father probably was an angry person. And it was to the point where it was consuming my lifestyle. It was consuming me. And I had to come to a point where I had to look in this word and I had to understand that the Spirit of God can renew my attitude and my heart and I had to get in this word, and I had to look and see, what, what does the Bible say who I am? Who am I created to be? What does the Bible say about, about John in here? And I had to find scripture after scripture after scripture. I wrote it down on note cards. I wrote, I wrote several out. And in the mornings, I would get up, and I'd read those note cards about the truth of who I am in Christ Jesus. And in, at lunchtime, I would read those note cards about the truth of who I am in Christ Jesus. And at night before I'd go to bed, I'd read those. And when I was driving in my car so I wouldn't have road rage, I would put those cards or a Bible underneath my, my, my leg as I was driving down the road so that I could be reminded of the truth of who I am in Christ Jesus. See, the problem, the problem with habitual sin, the problem with that in our lives is is it is full of deceit, as Paul said. Because when we are involved in that type of stuff, we are deceived of who we are in Christ Jesus. We begin to, to think that we are a failure. We begin to continue to look at ourselves as someone who just messed up again. We begin to not be able to forgive ourselves over and over and over. And, that, and, and, and the devil loves that about that. And that is not who we are created to be in Christ Jesus. What other people say about you is irrelevant. What you think about yourself is most irrelevant. But what the truth, what the Word of God says about you is the most relevant thing that you can cling to in this world as a Christ follower. This is what is most important. And if you are struggling with, with this kind of sin, then I encourage you, you need to get into the, the Word of God. You need to allow the Spirit of God to transform your heart, to transform your attitude. And it can work, and it will happen. Why? Because the Bible says it can. It's the promise of God's word. It's the promise of God's word. Grace, his grace abounds. His mercy abounds. When we accept him and we are a new creation, we are freed from that. And we have to go away from the intellectual understanding of that to the understanding that, that God has the authority and God has done that in our lives. But it has to be his spirit that does it through us and in us. 
I love, and Cliff, I'm sorry, I'm kind of, I'm kind of flipping passages on you. I love what uh, Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy. He so encourages him to stay on focus. He gives him such encouragement to stay focused about what's going on in his life. He says, but you, Timothy, man of God. Right off the bat, he says, but you, Timothy, let me just remind you who you are. You are a man of God. You are a Christ follower. Run for your life from all of this. Pursue a righteous, pursue a righteous life, a life of wonder, faith, love, steadiness, courtesy. Run hard and fast in faith. Seize the eternal life, the life you were called to, the life you so fervently embraced in the presence of so many witnesses. Listen, Timothy, he says, my dear friend Timothy, you are a man of God, and you need to run from all this that's going on. Now, what was going on in, in, in Timothy? I mean, basically, there's all kinds of things going on is why he wrote him this letter. One of the things was there's so many false teachings going on around him, and there were so many lies that were being taught around him. He said, listen, run from all this. Don't forget, stay focused that you are a man of God, and you need to seize the eternal life, the eternal life the life you were called to, that moment in time when you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I want to remind you of that, Timothy. I want to remind you of that because you know what? There are people around you, there are many witnesses around you that saw God working in your life. There's people that have seen that and experienced that in your life. And I want to remind you of that. Stay on focus. Stay on point, Timothy. And he says in verse 13, he says, I'm charging you before the life-giving God and before Christ who took his stand before Pontius Pilate and didn't give an inch. Keep this command to the letter and don't slack off. Our master, Jesus Christ, is on his way. He'll show up just at the right time. His, his arrival is what is guaranteed by the blessed and undisputed ruler, high king, high God. He's the only one death can't touch. His light's so bright no one can get close. He has never been seen by human eyes. Human eyes can't even take him in, he says. Honor to him an eternal rule. Oh, yes. It's almost like honor to him, eternal rule. Can I get an amen, right? I mean, he's, he's, he's excited here. He's encouraging him here. He says, listen, stay focused on who you are. And don't forget, he's coming again. Christ is coming again. Remember your purpose, Timothy. Remember why you're here. Because Christ is coming again. Remember, I have put you here as a disciple of mine, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, to share his love, to invest in the people around you, to invest in the church around you, to invest in those around you, to show his love and his mercy and his forgiveness. I'm so glad that we are freed from the things if we want to be. I'm so glad that my God sent his son to die on a cross, that we might be and experience a new life in him. The problem is, is we just don't stay focused. The problem is, is that we allow things in our lives to pull us off our focus. The thing is, we allow, we allow our priorities and we allow sin to do that. I love the, the scripture that we opened up the, the service with. I love that scripture in Romans. So what do you think? With God on your side like this, how can we lose? How can we lose? If God didn't hesitate to put everything on the line for us, embracing your condition and exposing himself to the worst by sending his own son, is there anything else he wouldn't gladly and, free, and, and freely do for us? And who would dare tangle with God by messing with one of God's chosen? Who would dare even point a finger, the one who died for us, who was, who was raised to life for us, is in the presence of God at this very moment sticking up for us. Do you think anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ and Christ's love for us? There is no way. Not trouble, not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying threats, not backstabbing, not even the worst sins listed in Scripture can separate us from God's love. Amen to that. Let's pray. God, thank you so much that we have an opportunity to be created new. Thank you, God, so much that through you and in you, we are a new person. We are a new being. The old is gone. 
and the new is here. God, help us as at, at times we just, we just lose focus. God, we are busy people. I get that. I'm a busy person. I get that. But God, sometimes we just allow the busyness of life and the, prior, to, 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 and the priorities of life just to kind of overtake our focus. God, help us to stay focused on who you are and who we are in you. God, help us to stay focused on the purpose for why you created us. God, thank you again for your love. Thank you, God, for your son, Jesus Christ. And it's your precious and your holy name we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand. And if there's uh, something you need to, to chat with about, um, I'm Val Beer over here. Pastor Dave's in the back on, the, on campus. And uh, Pastor Tony's, I'm sure, around here somewhere. Christy's here in the middle. We'd love to talk with you. We'd love to share with you whatever we can do to, to help you. Uh, just go ahead and stand and join the band.
to just sit in silence for a second, isn't it? Just kind of soak that in, right? Um, Boy, I tell you what, I don't know about you, but for me, the the theme today was just, isn't it cool how God's grace and mercy changes us and deals with things that sometimes are very deep-seated in our lives, and in the process of that, then God's love and mercy works through us, too. Works in us so that it can work through us, and we saw that even as just, we've had opportunity to... uh, to send folks away to go work in nationally known ministries and uh, partner with other people to plant in other parts of the state and know, know Northbridge that you have a part in seeing the gospel advance in Texas and other in, in, in you know East Asia this summer. So it's so cool to be a part of that. Uh, be praying for those folks, uh, everyone. Uh, don't forget that on Memorial Day we will uh, be having one service at 10 o'clock. I don't want you to miss out on that. So would you... Uh, as you go into the world today, would you know that Christ works in us so that he can work through us? Go in peace. You are dismissed. Have a great and wonderful day.